the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. their invitation to the volunteer chaplains to participate in that service. Three students from Virginia Seminary also served as Eucharistic ministers. It was a glorious evening in that beautiful building. Everything about the service was breathtaking. The music, the flowers, the vestments, lighting the great fire inside the building. It made me nervous, but it was spectacular. Babies and adults welcomed through the waters of holy baptism, and a rousing sermon preached as only our presiding Michael, Bishop Michael Curry can preach. The next week I heard from one of the seminarians about their trip home. As they walked away from the cathedral down the darkened streets to the metro, they noticed a pile of trash in front of them. They stepped around it and continued on their way, caught up in their conversation. A voice called out, you didn't even notice me. Where was the voice coming from? Was it speaking to them? Turning around, they saw what they had thought to be a pile of trash stirring. As they looked more closely, they discovered it wasn't a pile of trash at all, but a man dressed in dark clothing, wrapped in a dark blanket, lying on the sidewalk wearing a sign that read, hungry, need help. The seminarians were startled that they hadn't seen this man. How could they not have noticed him? True, they were caught up in their conversation about the beautiful church service they just participated in, and the streets were dark. But perhaps, they realized, they hadn't wanted to see him. 
There are so many homeless people in the city, it would be impossible to help all of them. But would it be possible to notice them? I believe that was the greatest sin of the rich man, not noticing. Nothing suggests this man was evil or did anything to harm Lazarus or anyone else. He was just too caught up in his own stuff to notice anyone else. Lazarus hung out at the gate of his house, often enough that the rich man knew his name, often enough that Lazarus knew what the rich man had for dinner. A house, even an extravagant house in that day, would likely have had only one door. The rich man would have had to walk by Lazarus every time he went in or out. He was probably too busy thinking about his beautiful things, his purple clothes, his fine Egyptian linen underwear, and the sumptuous feast he would enjoy that evening. He didn't even notice poor, emaciated Lazarus, covered with swords, swarmed by flies, licked by dogs. Lazarus was starving, and he would have been happy to grovel for the scraps and crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. In that time before there were napkins, the well-to-do would use a piece of bread to wipe their mouth, and then they'd toss it on the floor. It was that discarded bread, covered with the rich man's saliva, Lazarus would have been happy to eat. That's how hungry he was. But the rich man didn't see any of this. He simply walked around the man in front of his door and continued on his way. If we don't notice those in need, we won't be moved to do anything about their need. Jesus tells this parable of the rich man and Lazarus to the Pharisees, who were just described as lovers of money. They had ridiculed Jesus for his remarks about money in the preceding parable of the unjust steward, the one we heard last week. We remember the chilling ending of last week's gospel, you cannot serve God and wealth. Both parables are located in a chapter Luke devotes to Jesus' teaching about wealth and possessions and our relationship to them. And I know I've said this before and just recently, but I believe it bears repeating. Jesus has very little to say about matters of sex and sexuality. He has a whole lot more to say about wealth and possessions and our relationship to them. And the letter to Timothy echoes Jesus' caution about the negative effects money can have on our life and on our faith. As he repeats a proverb widely used in, anti in antiquity, money is the root of all evil. Today's parable is the only parable in all of the parables Jesus tells in which a person is named. Only Luke tells this parable, and it's likely borrowed in part from a Greek, Egyptian, or Jewish folktale. All three traditions had similar tales describing the afterlife. But just as our jokes about meeting St. Peter at the pearly gates don't give an accurate description of heaven, so this parable should not be taken as such. This is not a parable about life after death. The rich man asking about Lazarus returning from the dead to warn his brothers to change their ways is perhaps a foreshadowing of Jesus' resurrection but it's not a description of the resurrected life. The poor man, man's name, Lazarus, which ironically means God helps, could anticipate another man named Lazarus, whom Jesus raises from the dead in John's Gospel. But this parable isn't really about life after death. Rather, it picks up on some of Luke's favorite themes for life before death. Reversals of fortune, wealth and possessions, and care of the poor and the least among us. Luke loves reversals. Upon learning she'll give birth to God's son, Mary bursts into a song that celebrates reversals of status. Just as God has looked with favor on this poor peasant young woman, so the mighty will be cast down from their thrones while the lowly will be lifted up. The hungry will be filled with good things while the rich will be sent away empty. We see that happening in this parable. In life, there's a great chasm between the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man has everything he could possibly want, 
He lives in a gated community and dresses in the most expensive clothes. When he dies, this unnamed rich man receives a proper burial. Lazarus, by contrast, has nothing. No home, not enough food, no one to care for him or his wounds. Dogs were considered unclean in his culture, so in addition to leaving him open to infection, their licking of Lazarus's sores also rendered him ritually unclean. When Lazarus dies, we're told the angels carried him away. There was no one and no money to bury him. Look what happens after both men, men die. There is the great reversal. Lazarus is comforted by Abraham and sits at his side. The rich man is in agony, longing for just a drop of water to quench his parched mouth. There's no one to comfort him. Notice, though, that he still thinks he's in charge, barking orders to Abraham, expecting Lazarus to wait on him. There's now another great chasm between the two men. The rich man could have done something to bridge that first chasm. He passed by Lazarus every day, but he never really saw him. He failed to share his wealth to bridge the first gap between them. Though both called Abraham father, the rich man refused to see Lazarus as his brother. Now there's nothing he can do about this second chasm. It is too late. But wait, he commands Abraham. Send Lazarus to warn my five brothers before it's too late for them. He still thinks Lazarus is beneath him, that he can bark orders to his water boy, his errand boy, his messenger. What about us? We are the rich man's brothers and sisters. It's not too late for us to bridge the chasm yet. Who might we be failing to notice, failing to see as our brother or sister in Christ? In our baptismal covenant, we've promised to seek and serve Christ in all persons. How can we do a better job of noticing those who are carrying heavy burdens, those who live across the chasm from us? One of the downtown D.C. churches invited several homeless and formerly homeless people to come and talk with their mission committee. One man on the committee said, when people approach me on the street and ask me for money, I don't know what to do. Follow your heart, one of the homeless men answered. Sometimes the money you give will be used for food. Sometimes it will not. So follow your heart. Tell me yes or tell me no, but treat me like a person. We spend our whole day not being seen. So please, don't act like we're not there. I must confess that's a place where I have work to do. As I drive down Route 7 and see the folks asking for help, it's so much easier to look away than it is to look them in the eye, to do anything to lessen the chasm between them and me. What an incredible job the community of Martha's Vineyard did to build a bridge over the chasm between them and the plane load of migrants that landed on their island home with no notice the week before last. Those 50 human beings arrived with no idea where they were. Many of them were from Venezuela and had worked, walked through the treacherous mud of a remote Central American jungle. A number of their fellow travelers died literally stuck in the mud. The guests arrived with little but the clothes on their backs. One migrant, walking by a restaurant, noticed a hamburger was $26. That's more money than I earned in a month when I could get work. The chasm between the migrants and their hosts was indeed deep and wide. The coming together by volunteers, elected officials, faith communities, and business leaders to tap their collective resources for the common good was warm and generous and creative. High school Spanish students helped bridge the language chasm. St. Andrew's Episcopal Church mobilized to provide housing in their parish house, and so many others participated. One resident who works as a cab driver and lives in his car bought $100 worth of sweets and brought them to the guests because I felt compassion, he said. 
Another worker with limited means handed a folded $100 bill to one of the men, noting, we're brothers. For 44 hours, these migrants knew what it was to be cared about, to be cared for, to be noticed. After the guests left the island, one of the many who had participated in this ministry of radical hospitality said, they enriched us. Their visit has left an indelible mark on Martha's Vineyard. So, fellow siblings of the rich man, how will we respond to this parable of Lazarus and the rich man? Financially, we're each in different places, but against the world's standards, I think just about every one of us would be considered rich. How might we, with God's help, open our eyes to those in need in our community and beyond? What actions might we be called to take to bridge the chasm between ourselves and those who have little, those who are carrying different kinds of burdens? I wonder how we'll be enriched by those we seek to help. Amen. <laughs>